And everybody said, yeah. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you tonight. We we'll bless your name for your choosing leaders and servants. We we'll pray, Lord, that your spirit will abide upon all your people in Jesus' name. Yeah. And we we'll pray, Lord, you'll strengthen everyone. Yeah. Increase our understanding. And we pray you make us successful on this work in Jesus' name. Bless us to bless your people. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless you. We're coming to 2 Timothy chapter 1. And I'm reading from verses 13 and 14. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. Hold fast. The form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus, that good thing which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. As you know, Paul the Apostle, Timothy's mentor and Timothy's leader was writing to him. And I was expecting him, he will so hear the word of God. And he will so be influenced by the word of God that he will stand on that word so that he can make a success of the calling the Lord had given unto him. And the reason he told him to hold fast the form of sound words he had heard is that there were some challenges in the church. In the church at Ephesus, where he was as a pastor, as a leader. Let's come to First Timothy chapter 1, verse 3. It says, As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus, when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest judge some, that they teach no other doctrine. That means there's a challenge in that church, in the church at Ephesus, where Timothy was the pastor. And uh, Timothy was to carry on the work of God without fear, without intimidation, and without any wavering, and without fainting in the heart at all. We understand that from the beginning, Satan has labored tirelessly, relentlessly to corrupt the church, to hinder the conversion of the world by contaminating the truth, the saving truth, and by falsifying faith. That is saving faith. In these last days too, we have the same challenge. The devil is not slowing down, but he's multiplying his ways to broaden the road that leads to perdition. And Timothy was to sit back and to think through and to meditate on the calling that he had. Would you understand that Timothy was commissioned and called to be number one, a pastor. Number two, to be a teacher. Number three, to be an evangelist. Number four, to be a trainer of Christian leaders for the multiplication of discipleship and for the multiplication of churches and for the multiplication of the effect of the church of the living God. He was called to be a pastor. Look at First Timothy chapter 1 verse 3. As I besought thee to, to still abide at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia. That is, it was to abide there, to be a pastor and to be the leader in that place. And then it says that thou mightest charge some to exercise the authority of a pastor that those people there will teach no other doctrine. I come to chapter 4 verse 6. In chapter 4 verse 6, if thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine whereunto thou hast attained. So you understand he was a pastor. We're coming to chapter 5 verse 1. Rebuke not an elder but entreat him as a father and also the younger men as brethren. The elder women as mothers and the younger as sisters with all purity. Then he gives him other instructions. Look at chapter 3 verse 15. 
chapter 3 verse 15 tells us chapter 3 verse 15 it tells us this it says but if i tell it long that thou mightest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of god which is the church of the living god the pillar and the ground of truth so it's established in the word of god that timothy was supposed to be a pastor called to be a pastor commissioned to be a pastor trained to be a pastor and was to exercise the authority of a pastor but not only that it was to be a teacher of the word of god teacher of the word of god in second timothy chapter one second timothy chapter one verse six wherefore i put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of god which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. Not only that he had authority, he had anointing. Not only that he had anointing, he had also the power endowed upon him or put upon him so that he would minister as a preacher, as a teacher, as a pastor. For God, verse 7, has not given us the spirit of fear. If you are fearful and timid, you will not be able to do the work of the pastor and of the teacher like you ought to do. And of the evangelist like you ought to do. And so Paul the Apostle reminded Timothy that God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Chapter 2 verse 2. And it says that thou wast search of me among many witnesses, the same commit to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. You are a teacher, you reproduce teachers. You are a shepherd, you reproduce shepherds. And you are a pastor, you reproduce pastors. You are an evangelist, reproduce evangelists. And as God has called you, Timothy, to be a teacher, a teacher of the word, teaching the whole counsel of God, you raise up other people to and commit the word into their hands that they will be able to teach others also. Chapter 2, verse 15. Chapter 2, 2 Timothy, chapter 2, verse 15, study to show thyself approved unto God. In the calling you have received, in the commission you have received, you want to study to show, you want to endeavor to show, you want to train yourself to show, you want to discipline yourself so that everything you ought to have, all the qualities you ought to have, and all the, all the strength you ought to have, you have everything and then you give out to the people, study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the the word of truth we're coming to chapter 4 verse 5 chapter 4 verse 5 but watch thou in all things endure affliction do the work tell me tell me out loud do the work of an evangelist make full proof of thy ministry we've gone through all that for you to understand that it is possible for a single person to be a pastor to be a teacher, to be an evangelist, and then to raise up other people, to train other people. And that is the pattern the Lord has given us in the church, that those of us who are leading the people of God, those of us who are pastors in the church of the living God, we are not just pastors to love people. Yes, we love people. We are not just pastors to gather people to Yes, we we'll gather them together. We are not just pastors to fellowship with the people and to make sure that we keep the membership of the church. We are also teachers teachers of the word of god we must know the doctrines of the bible understand the doctrines of the bible believe the doctrines of the bible and be able to teach effectively and convincingly persuasively the doctrines of the word of god not only that we must be able to make the church to grow because we're to do the work of an evangelist and then to train other people train the workers and train the leaders so that all the various areas of the work will be effective and they will be well managed and we're making progress and i pray that as god is doing this for us every saturday and every tuesday and even on mondays as we come together i pray that all the plan of god and the purpose of god and the reason for exposing us to all these things the lord himself will help us to benefit from them in jesus name 
We're to preach the word. We're to preserve the word. We're to preach the whole truth of the gospel for salvation, for righteousness, for sanctification, for holiness, for Holy Ghost baptism, and for power to evangelize and to prepare the people of God ready, saved for the rapture. And everything we need to do, the Lord will open our eyes to our responsibilities. We'll do them in Jesus' name. Tonight we're looking at the message, preserving the truth against contamination. Preserving the truth against contamination. You see, the devil wants to pollute the word of God. He wants to corrupt the word of God. He wants to contaminate, destroy the effect of the word of God. And God raised up all the apostles so that he'll fight a good fight. He will finish his ministry. He will teach the whole counsel of God. And the same thing the Lord has raised up, uh, he raised up Timothy so that he'll do the same thing. And then he's raising you up and raising me up and raising us up so that what the Lord did through them, he will do through every one of us in Jesus' name. Did I hear an amen there? Amen. The three things we're going to look at. Number one, the presage corruption of saving faith. The presage corruption of saving faith. Number two, our personal commitment to the scriptural fullness. Our scriptural, our personal commitment to the scriptural fullness. That means the totality of the scripture, the complete scripture. And the whole counsel of God will fully commit ourselves to that because that's a calling and that's a commission. And if that's a calling and commission, that's what we need to consecrate, commit ourselves to our personal commitment to the scriptural fullness. Point number three, the perpetual caution against subtle falsehood. The perpetual caution against subtle false, falsehood. We're coming to number one, the present corruption of saving faith. The reason why Paul the Apostle challenged Timothy, and he said in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 13, and he said, hold fast. Don't let it go. Hold fast. Don't hold it with loose hand. Hold fast. Bring all your mind, all your senses, and everything you've got, and all your courage, all your conviction into this. Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me. See, Paul was not ashamed of what they had taught. He said, you heard it from me. It's the gospel. It's a full gospel. It's a free gospel. It's a gracious gospel. It's a gospel that brings us salvation, that brings us experiences from Calvary. It's a gospel that transfers the very life of Christ into the believer, into the Christian. He wasn't ashamed of that. And I was calling him to be not ashamed, therefore, of the testimony of our Lord. And if you're not ashamed, you hold fast the form of sad words when our side of me in faith and in love which is in Christ Jesus then he says in verse 14 it seems virtually the same thing but he's saying it another way and he says that good thing which was committed unto thee that good thing the gospel that good thing the word of God that good thing, the doctrine of salvation, sanctification, Holy Ghost baptism, that good thing, the totality of the word of God, that good thing, the saving gospel, the sanctifying gospel, and the sustaining gospel, that good thing, the thing that prepares people to get to heaven, that good thing which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost. You'll need more than your own personal strength to keep this. You'll need more than your own personal effort to keep this. You need the strength of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit. And you need the enablement of the Holy Spirit so that you will keep this good thing which has been committed unto thee. Keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. Why that? Hold fast. Why that? Beware. Why that? And keep this and keep it with all your heart and all your strength. Why all that? Because of the presage, corruption 
of saving faith. And let's come to First Timothy chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 5. So you understand the corruption that was already there at the time of Paul the Apostle. The corruption already there at the time of Timothy. And the reason why Timothy was to bring all his heart, all his strength, all his effort, and all the Christian graces and experiences he had into this so that he will keep this which was committed unto him. First Timothy chapter 1 verse 5. Now the end of the commandment, that means the purpose of the commandment, the goal of the commandment, the destination, the destiny. And the reason for the commandment is charity that's love out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith some faith from which look at this from which some having swerved have turned aside unto vain jangling you see they have, many people have turned aside away from the gospel away from the purity of the gospel and away from the proclamation of the true gospel look at verse 7 desiring to be teachers of the law understanding neither what they say nor whereof they are firm it's saying that many people have promoted themselves to be teachers and leaders and pastors and ministers and founders of churches and they do not understand the very basic of the gospel they do not understand the salvation that that gospel brings and it says because of that Timothy don't allow them to pollute everything to disorganize everything to destroy everything rise up and be firm and preach the gospel and preach that gospel persuasively look at verse 19 it says holding fast and, and a good uh, holding holding faith and a good conscience which some have been put away you see that they threw their consciences away they want to teach false doctrine they want to teach an erroneous way they want to do something wrong they want to lead people astray to the gates of the way of hell and they throw away their conscience and they sear their own consciences and so paul the apostle said there's a present corruption because the people who are leading the people of God they don't have any conscience anymore. Their consciences are hardened, their consciences are seared, their consciences are so toughened that even when they're destroying the field and destroying the church and destroying the people that Jesus died for, their conscience doesn't bother them doesn't break them and they don't feel sorry for anything and they're not going to do any restriction to anybody because after all they don't feel guilty and it says hey, timothy you know what when there are so many people that act as if there's no conscience as if there's no rule as if there's no standard as if there's no faith as if anybody can teach anything you have to hold the faith firm and you have to hold on to that good conscience which some have been put away concerning faith and made shipwreck. Look at verse 20. Of whom is Hermenius and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. There are people that raised up themselves as teachers and as leaders, and they corrupt the word of God, and they do that to even a level of blasphemy. And look at uh, Second Corinthians chapter 2 second corinthians chapter 2 we're looking at verse 17 second corinthians chapter 2 i'm reading from verse 17 it says for we are not as many who corrupt the word of god see what paul is saying see what the apostle is saying he said there are many that corrupt the word of god you understand let's say for example you maybe you're sick or a loved one is sick a mother a father is sick and then you want to buy medicine and you see that that medicine uh, eventually has been corrupted if, if you're not a person used to uh, reading what you have on the label you just swallow everything sometimes the thing has expired three months earlier six months earlier sometimes the thing has expired one year earlier and there are people who are still having that and still selling that and you just get in there and buy that thing and then you give to mommy you give to daddy and they swallow and although you have spent money there's no improvement they're not getting well you know why because it's adulterated you know why because that thing has lost its value the same thing with the gospel 
the gospel that saves when it's um, you know it's not real gospel it's an expired message what do you mean by that it's expired already they take it from the old testament and they put some old testament things together and they never get to the cross you preach a gospel that doesn't have the crucifixion of christ you preach a gospel that doesn't have the death of christ you preach a gospel that doesn't have the efficacy of the blood of jesus you preach a gospel that doesn't include the resurrection of jesus christ you preach a gospel that doesn't include the transformation of the life of the people you preach a gospel that doesn't include if any man be, be in christ is a new creature all things are passed away all things are become new you're still in the old testament all the references are from deuteronomy and from exodus and from leviticus and from numbers and then you join that together and you never get to the cross that thing is expired it's expired the old covenant is abolished now we're in the new covenant and the new covenant emphasizes christ as the foundation of, of our salvation emphasizing christ as the very cornerstone of our salvation emphasizes christ as the one that takes us out of darkness into the light and brings us out of condemnation and it brings us to the salvation of the lord but it says there are many people that corrupt the word of god other people corrupt the word of god because they remove something something central something important something essential out of the gospel what's that repentance repentance just raise up your hand just believe on the lord don't allow anything to condemn you and don't feel guilty guilty about anything they remove repentance once you take repentance away you have taken a major part a major ingredient out of the contents of the gospel it's like you know you put uh, the pharmacies will put some things together and the very essential things nutrients and ingredients that you should mix together in the proportion and the percentage that's not there and they just put that in your hand and then you swallow that and it does nothing good in your life adulterated gospel a gospel that doesn't have real repentance in it is not going to save anyone other people add some other things to it it's like you know again you are making uh, some medicine and then you add other things traditional thing concoction into it and you mix everything together it doesn't work and the same thing when you add tradition and you add all the religious uh, you know baggage that people have from the world and they put everything together and they add it to the gospel they are corrupting the word of god it says but we are not as many we corrupts the word of God but as of sincerity I pray you'll be sincere Amen. but as of God in the sight of God will speak in Christ I pray you speak the truth in Jesus name we're looking at Malachi Malachi chapter 2 and I'm reading here from verse 8 Malachi chapter 2 we're looking at verse 8 if we're going to preach the gospel preach the gospel you're going to preach the truth preach the truth the truth saves and the truth sanctifies and the truth purifies and the truth prepares us for the life eternal we're looking at malachi chapter 2 and verse 8 it says but he had departed out of the way he have caused many to stumble at the law if you look at the church in our country and the church in our continent although there are many many preaching going many preachings going on everywhere there's a you know camp there there's convention there there's conference there there's this and there's this there the crusades everywhere when you listen to the things that are coming out sometimes it's just what we call motivational talk motivational talk just uh, you know encourage people and lift up people everything will be all right everybody is good in the sight of god god is so loving and god is so kind and in fact god is so kind that you know helps everybody blesses everybody and if you just say uh, you know keep this offering and sow his seed and sow this and that god is going to look at you as if everything is all right as if the sowing of the seed replaces the blood of jesus replaces calvary replaces the cross and replaces 
repentance and replaces the real definite experience we ought to have and the people do not know about overcoming sin about living the life of righteousness and about what Jesus Christ said neither do I condemn you on the basis of the mercy of God but go and sin no more on the basis of the grace of God and so it says over here look at it in verse 8 again it says they have departed out of the way and they have caused many to stumble at the law ye have corrupted look at that ye have corrupted the covenant of Levi says the Lord of hosts therefore have I made you also a contemptible and a and base before all the people according as ye have not cared my way but tell me the rest there tell me out loud I've been partial in the law partial in the word of God in the preaching of the word of God in the presentation of the word of God it says partial partial in the word of God what does that mean it is subtract some important things out of the word of God they subtract the things that are actually important for the gospel from the word of God falsified faith and faith with no repentance faith with no trust in the crucified christ the risen christ that cannot save any soul at all a corrupted faith a contaminated faith having addition of tradition addition of human philosophy addition of dangerous elements addition of uh, you know human proverbs human principles and human ideology all that is deadly all that is dangerous i'll be disappointing uh, eternally Let, let's come back to first timothy chapter 4 even at the time of timothy paul the apostle was warning timothy he said you know timothy is dangerous time difficult time and it's a, a perilous time it tells us in uh, first timothy chapter 4 and i'm reading from verse uh, reading from verse 1 now the spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith you see that and if they depart from the faith and they stop preaching maybe it will be better for the world but they don't stop preaching they depart from the faith they depart from some doctrine they depart from the reality of the gospel and the fullness of the gospel and they keep on preaching and they keep their title as bishop as reverend as pastor as uh, whatever and that's a dangerous sin and the people do not know that they have departed from the faith and it says giving it to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils there are doctrines of devils the devil does not want anyone to get saved the devil does not want anyone to get sanctified the devil does not want anyone to get to heaven and so the devil will give a substitute the thing that will not allow people to repent the things that will not allow people to make restitution the things that will not allow people to live righteous lives and who Holy lives and then they will still be preaching and they will be preaching intelligently and it will look sound it will look good it will look very well except that they are taking away the real heart of the gospel except that they have taken away the real sin nucleus and kernel of the gospel that will get the people convicted that will get them converted that will get them committed to the words of the Lord and it says speaking lies in hypocrisy speaking lies in the hypocrisy there are people that can you know, they open the bible and they read the verse and then they tear the verse away from the context they tear the verse away from the continuity of the word they take it off out of context they misinterpret and then they put some actions into what they are saying and the people do not know head or tail of what they are hearing and it says having their conscience seared with a hot and I pray God will deliver us from that. I say God will deliver us from that. Even if they're doing that outside, we will not do that here. We'll stay with the word of God. There will be no corruption in your preaching. There will be no contamination in your preaching. With all sincerity of heart and with all devotion, dedication of life, you preach the word as you ought to preach the word in Jesus' name. And look at this in 1 Timothy chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 12. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 12. Having damnation because they have cast off the first faith. 
Look at that. Having the mission because they have cast off their false faith. They got saved on the, on the basis of the real faith. Real faith in Christ. They repented of their sins. They called upon the Lord Jesus Christ. They also they made restitution those many years ago. But now they're preachers. Now they're popular. Now everybody is seeking after them. Now they are conference speakers. And because they are like that, they've cast up their false faith. Look at verse 15. For some are already turned aside. After who? After Satan. Some are already turned aside after Satan. We're looking at chapter 6 verses 20 and 21. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 20 and 21. O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science, falsely so called. There are other people that will bring in what they call science and they don't believe creation anymore. Now they believe evolution and they don't believe that now a man was, uh, you know, born in sin and that man was evil at heart. They believe that only your environment, uh, you know, changes. If you give them a good environment, everybody will be a good person. If you give them good governance, everybody will be a good person. And if you give them all the amenities they need, everybody will be alright. They are doing evil Evil, not because they want to do evil but because, and not because their heart is evil that's what they say but because the environment is evil because society is evil if you just improve society then you are going to improve their lives and there's no place for the transforming power of the gospel and of the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ and it says Timothy avoid this kind of profane thing and the vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so called which some professing have erred concerning the faith some professing they have erred concerning the faith you will not err you will not go astray will stand on this gospel to the very end in Jesus name second Timothy chapter 2 I'm reading from verse 16 second Timothy chapter 2 verse 16 for Sean profane and vain babblings for, for they will increase to more ungodliness. Have you seen that, you know, churches are multiplying in the land? Ungodliness is multiplying. Crime is multiplying. Evil is multiplying. And the family disorganization, divorce, oppression is multiplying. And yet there are so many churches. You know why? Because we're not hearing the truth in many of those churches. We're not speaking the truth in many of those churches. We're not emphasizing the truth in many of those churches. It says it increases on godliness. And their word, verse 17, will eat as does a canker of whom is Simonius and Philetus, who concerning the truth, look at this, have erred. Concerning the truth, what have they done? Tell me out loud. They have erred. It happened at that time and it is happening today. There are some people that have respect for false preachers. They have respect for false teachers. You know why? They have always respected them. Anytime they hear the name of, you know, Bishop so and so, Pastor so and so, Reverend so and so, 30 years ago, the respect they had for them is still the respect they have for them now. They're not finding out what are they preaching today. What do they stand today? What are they telling the people today? And they use all the means, all the media to do that and to pollute the gospel and to confuse the people. And it says over here that these concerning the truth they have heard saying the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some. Overthrow the faith of some. You see there are preachers who are overthrowing the faith of other people and if you're not vigilant on your congregation they are members of our own church you know, they hear this through their YouTube they hear this uh, through the media they hear this through social media they hear this through whatever internet and all that and whatever you are seeing in the church they listen to those people outside more and if you are not checking up and if you are not standing on the word of God you are just laboring for nothing because all those people uh, they are even sending tithes and sending offering to those places 
diseases so that those people have more money to propagate their error but God will help you to stand and to stand firm and to stand militant on the word of God in Jesus name I'm looking at chapter 3 chapter 3 of 2nd Timothy 2nd Timothy chapter 3 and we're reading from verse 1 this know also that in the latter days perilous times shall come for men shall be lovers of their own selves that's it uh, they, they center on themselves they concentrate on themselves how much money they can have how much uh, whatever it is they want to get and they're covetous and boasters and proud and blasphemous and disobedient to parents unthankful and holy without natural affection truth truth uh, breakers false accusers incontinent fears and despisers of those that are good and they can pull down any other preacher who is uh, preaching the truth and they'll you know talking about you know those who are narrow-minded and those who are you know straight jacket and those who are still on holiness holiness and those who are you know heaven heaven all the time but here we stand on this and they make jest of the real way that leads to heaven but you cannot be intimidated with that you'll not be intimidated in jesus name and it says uh, these are traitors these are heady they're high-minded they're lovers of pleasures more than lovers of god you have celebration festival this this and that and it's all merriment and it says having the form of godliness but denying the power thereof tell me the rest tell me out loud from such turn away you'll not help them you'll not aid them you'll not recommend them you'll not patronize them you'll not exalt them you'll not flatter them because that's the word of God. We need to stand on the word of God. The word that leads people to life eternal. Second Timothy chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 3. Second Timothy chapter 4. Reading from verse 3. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. They hear repentance, you know, that you know, they begin to, you know, they feel discomfort. And they hear about holiness, they feel some discomfort. And they feel, they hear about getting ready for heaven, they feel some discomfort because the time has come over them when they will not endure some doctrine. But after their own law shall they heed to themselves, teachers having itching ears, they shall turn away their ears from the truth. What do they turn to? And they shall turn to fables. And look at, uh, you know, this man. It happened to him. Verse 10. For demons has forsaken me, having loved this present world. Demas forsook Paul the apostle, having loved this present world. We're looking at Second Peter chapter 3, chapter 2. Second Peter chapter 2. And we're reading from verse 1. In Second Peter chapter 2, verse 1. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privately, privately, secretly, shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves, what? Tell me out loud. Swift destruction. And tell me verse 2. Tell me out loud, please. You know, some people say, if somebody is preaching false doctrine, how can they have a crowd? Of course, of course, they'll have a crowd. A place where there's no repentance, a place where you don't emphasize restitution, a place where you don't emphasize righteousness, a place where you don't emphasize holiness, a place where you don't emphasize right living, a place where there's no godliness, a place where everybody can do whatever they want to do. And they just still say, God bless you. God is so loving. And God is so kind and God does not mind today that anybody continues in sin. There will be many people there but where you stand for the word of God is the people that are interested in going to heaven that will come. And thank God the people here were on our way to heaven. Yeah. Somebody there said we're on our way to heaven. Yeah. Or oh, where are you going? Yeah. I said where are you going? Yeah. 
That's why we're hearing the word. That's why we're standing on the word. And that's why we're preaching the word without fear and without favor. It says, and many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness, you see that, shall they with vain words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. Look at verse 18. It says, is in verse 18 for when they speak great swelling words of vanity you know they, they can talk and use language and use communication and sway the minds of the people but when you analyze everything that has been said there's nothing there they're just it's just wind it's just a breath coming out because it doesn't challenge anyone to turn away from evil it doesn't challenge anyone to turn away from occultism it doesn't challenge anyone to turn away from darkness and turn to the light it doesn't challenge anyone for conversion for transformation and for getting ready for heaven and there's no substance there that's why it says when they speak great swelling words of vanity they are lure, they entice as through the lust of the flesh and through much wantonness those that were clean escaped from them to live in error while they promise them liberty they themselves are the servants of corruption for of whom a man is overcome of the same is he brought in bondage for if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through through the knowledge of the lord and savior jesus christ they again entangled therein you see that they escaped they were saved they were born again, they were begotten into the kingdom, and then they go back to the world, and they again entangle therein and overcome. What happens to them? I say, what happens to them? Oh, once saved, always saved. Is that right? Once a child of God, always a child of God. Is that right? Once on the way to heaven, always on the way to heaven. Is that right? No. It says, if they overcome the latter end, is worse with them than the beginning. That's what the Lord is challenging us. We must have commitment to scriptural truth. You'll be committed. I said you'll be committed. Did you hear that kind of amen? Amen. You will be committed in Jesus' name. And everything that is weak in your spine and weak in your backbone, tonight, the Lord will strengthen you. And it will answer your prayer before beyond your expectation in Jesus' name. We're coming to point number two now. Our personal commitment to the scriptural fullness. Our personal commitment to the scriptural fullness. This is a personal thing. This is not a community thing, a corporal thing. This is not a fellowship thing. It's not for the assembly. It's for you as a person that whatever others do, however others compromise, I am going to stand on the word of God. Because God says, I am God, I change not. Because we know about Jesus Christ as Savior and our Lord, the same yesterday, today, and for Forever. And because we know the word of God, the word of Christ remains the same. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. That's the reason why you as a person, and you know the validity and the truth of the word of God. You want to stand on that word and say, by the grace of God, I will stand on this word. I said I will stand on this word. We're coming back to 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. And we're reading from verse 13. And reading from verse 14. 2 Timothy chapter 1. Verse 13. Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. That good thing which was committed unto thee keep by the holy ghost which dwelleth in us it is not enough to quietly believe the truth you're not just a quiet believer you're not a private believer you're a pastor you're a teacher you're an evangelist you're a trainer you're leading other people what you say affects other people what you preach affects other people. So you cannot just say privately, I know what I believe. No, you cannot do that. 
You're not a private believer. And because you're a proclaimer of the gospel, you must openly affirm and you must publicly declare your commitment to the word of God. Let us know where you stand. Let the congregation know that this is the word of truth and that you can stake your life on it. We reveal a personal commitment by wholeheartedly believing the truth in our family, in our personal lives, in our decisions, in our actions, in our behavior. We behave according to what we believe. If you find a person that his behavior is, you know, is not certain, is not predictable, is here and there, he doesn't believe anything, you, know, you behave according to your belief. And so, if you really believe the word of God, you're going to behave like that. You'll obey the word. You abide in the word. You live in a practical way in the truth. And you preach all the contents and counsels of divine revelation in the scriptures if you really believe it you'll preach it when you believe something wholeheartedly with all your heart all your soul and all your mind you'll preach it if you believe that this is the only way that leads to heaven you'll say it if you believe that without holiness no man shall see the lord and you love the people you want them to get to heaven you will voice it out you'll not say well i'll not say that then you don't believe it you don't really believe that if the people are not holy if the people are not righteous that if the people are not born again with a very definite experience that they cannot get to heaven because you don't believe that that's why you are quiet but if you know that the most important thing is that a man be born again the most important thing is that his righteousness which is inner righteousness which is gracious righteousness which is christ-like righteousness must exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the pharisees if you believe that in the depths of your heart you'll open your mouth you'll declare so that the people will hear and the people will know and the people prepare for heaven i pray lord i pray that the lord will help every one of us that we will know what you believe you will stand for something i said you will stand for something you don't just be a wishy-washy preacher and then you just motivate people and you know raise up the people the mind of the people and then we say what did you say what did he preach? What did he emphasize? I would say, well, we don't really know. He didn't emphasize anything. He just said, us, be joyful, be happy. God is good. Isn't it a wonderful thing to belong to a church like this? I don't know the wonder in that. If there's no salvation in that place, I don't know the wonder in that. If there's no holiness in that place, I don't know the wonder in that. If there's nothing definite in the Christian experience that we know that this is going to take us to heaven. If you believe the word, God, you'll be committed to the whole truth that implies no part of the truth will be hidden no part of the truth will be kept away from your congregation over a long period of time and there is uh, no part of the truth that will be so emphasized to make us forget other parts that are important other parts that are necessary or make us neglect or make us disobey any other part our preaching should not only enlighten the mind, inform the head, it should convict the sinners. It should convict the backsliders. It should convert the soul. It should change the habits and the character of people. It should warn and confront careless believers. You see people who are careless, you confront them. You will not say, in the days in which you are living now, if you confront anybody, it will be trouble. What kind of trouble? The trouble they are going to get to in hellfire is forever. If they react against you, if they oppose you, if they confront you, if they do anything, and after you confront them, it's temporary. And it's good to suffer for them. Suffer so that they will know this man means what he's saying. This woman means what she's saying. That even though we oppose her, even though we persecute her, even though we criticize her, even though we make life tough for her, yet she keeps on emphasizing that this thing must be very 
important because you know that without what you are preaching without what you are emphasizing to them they will perish and you don't want them to perish therefore you don't care what kind of persecution you may have what kind of suffering you may have because if that will rescue them from hell that will be wonderful if that will help them not to get into hell fire forever and ever that will be wonderful therefore you, you count the cause you see it's better for me to suffer for them even at their hand than for me to neglect them and abandon them and allow them to get to hell fire because of that you'll emphasize conversion because of that you emphasize being born again because of that you emphasize sanctification because of that you emphasize holiness without which no man shall see the lord because of that you emphasize one man one wife until death do them part because of that you are going to emphasize that we live a life that is righteous a life that is pure whether we're inside or we're outside in the public or in the private you emphasize that so that should the trumpet sound anytime you'll not be guilty of the blood of anyone i'm expecting a great amen there uh, look at this, look at this in 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 13. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 13. It says in verse 13, Ye, if but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. It says, but continue thou. I will continue. I said I will continue. I received the gospel so many years ago and thank God I still continue. And you have received the gospel now a number of years ago and thank God you continue. I said thank God you continue. Rainy season you continue. Dry season you continue. When people smile at you you continue. When people frown at you you continue. You continue in Jesus' name. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast heard them. Look at verse 16. All scripture. How much of scripture? Tell me out loud. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. And he is, tell me, profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. We are coming to 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 1. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and we are reading from verse 1. It says in verse 1, I charge thee therefore before God, and the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Tell me verse 2. Preach the word, preach the word, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Instant in season, when it's all right, when there's fellowship, when there's friendship, when the people love it, when the people accept, preach it. Out of season, when there's some discomfort, when there are challenges, when there's opposition, when you lose friends, when people will not smile at you, when people see and they turn the face the other way, when they tell you we don't love you, we reject you, we abandon you, you preach at us too much and you say things that direct, you know, that affects us. Who reported us to you? Who told you about us? Why are you talking the way you are talking? And then they abandon you, you say good morning and they say, they look at you as if you are coming from you somewhere and they will not answer you out of season what are you going to do you preach the word you preach you have only one life and you have only one business and you have only one assignment and it is to preach the word whether people are in fellowship with you or they disfellowship you or they throw you away or they laugh at you or they laugh at your name that's not your concern your concern is you want to save the people from perishing preach the word be instant in season out of season reprove rebuke exhort without long suffering and doctrine for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine but after their own law shall they heave to themselves teachers having itching ears and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be touched unto fables but watch thou in all things watch thou in all things tell me what follows that shout it out say it aloud there's something to endure in the ministry 
And the ministry is not a bed of roses. The ministry is not all, oh, you know, we love you, we appreciate you, we accept you. There are difficult times. There are challenging times. There are times, you know, sometimes somebody is sick and you are trying to give them medicine. And the thing is bitter in their mouth. And they think you even hate them. And if, you know, you are trying to help them. They say, why are you giving me this? Why are you give this will help you. This will help you. This is the only thing that will get you out of this mess and out of, out of this danger. You want to prolong your life. You want them to have eternal life. To abide in eternal life. And therefore you are preaching the word of God to them. They don't understand that you love them. They don't understand that you are doing them good. They don't understand that this is the best thing you can and deal for them and because of that they'll hate you for it and they'll persecute you for it and they'll oppress you for it it says endure afflictions in the plural do the work of an evangelist make full proof of thy ministry and Paul the apostle now wants to tell Timothy I've done it you can do it I've done it you can do it and he's telling us today he has done it and you can do it somebody there said he has done it you can do it what are you he has done it you can do it you will do it I said you will do it. I said you will do it. He said, for I am ready to be offered. And the time of my departure is certain. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my cause. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. It will be yours in Jesus' name. Which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but to all them also. That love is appearing. We're coming to point number three. Perpetual caution. The perpetual Caution against subtle falsehood. Perpetual caution against subtle falsehood. We're coming to Second Timothy chapter one. Second Timothy chapter one, verse thirteen. Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith. And in love, which he is in Christ Jesus, that good thing which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. You see the reason why I was telling him this, Timothy was young, not too young, but at least younger, much younger than Paul the Apostle. And he needed to understand that falsehood is subtle, error is subtle. Nobody comes to you and says, can you buy this poison? It will kill you. No, they don't say that. You see the people that are selling all these uh, things uh, uh, all over on the streets at the bus stops and all that. And you, they know how to use language, human language, the local language. They, whether it's speaking English or they're using the local language, they use the language they say. They describe different kinds of sicknesses from the head to the toe. Internally, externally, the one that is running your belly and the one that is, uh, you know, kind of breaking your bone. And the one that, you know, you've gone to doctors, you've gone everywhere. But now they have this for you and this will cure anything and everything and it says say, don't go don't go come here let me introduce you to this if you have this in the night if you have this in the morning if you have this challenge in the afternoon have you had them before I said, have you had them before? And even though you know that this one is fake, but you as they begin to talk and talk, then you begin to say, Maybe this is true. What do I lose if I just give a few naira to this and get this one? And that's their aim. That's their aim. And the end they say, no, you can have this. They say, madam, don't go. Because this one, your little child that is having this, they start all over again and they catch your attention and everything is false. And falsehood is very subtle. That's how it catches people. And religious falsehood is as subtle as that. It gives false security. They say, 
once saved, always saved. They say once a son, always a son. And they say once in grace, always in grace. They will not even allow you to think. They will say God is sovereign. Isn't he sovereign? Once you say yes, God is powerful. Is he powerful? Yes. God is knowledgeable. Is he knowledgeable? Yes. And God already knows before you were born, he knew you were going to be born. Is it not so? Oh yes. And before you were saved, he knew you were going to be saved. And he planned your salvation. You are not the one that got saved. He is the one that chose you. He is the one that predestined you. And since he chose you before you were even born again, after you are born again, forever, forever you are saved. And they conclude in Jesus' name, Amen. And then you are dazed. There's something subtle there. If you didn't repent, you couldn't be saved. And you could have been saved before that time. Did God want you to be suffering in sin and following after Satan all those many years? No. Why were you not saved at that time? Because you have a choice. It says, I put before you life and death. Choose life that you may live. It says, uh, they will not come to me because they will not repent of their sin. It says, I'm giving them the truth. Even though he has not many miracles among them, yet they believe not. It's them that did not believe and it's because the people confused them and because of false doctrine that's why they didn't believe and the lord does not want anybody to perish does he want anybody to perish all the people that are perishing why are they perishing it's not because he wants them to perish and those of us that came into the kingdom it's not because you know he ordained and forced us and says you must be saved there is subtlety in the deception of the devil i pray the devil will not deceive you I said the devil will not deceive you. You see, if somebody wants to be deceived, to shake his head and say, uh, no, amen. But me, the devil will not deceive me. Yeah. We're looking at a second, second Corinthians chapter 11. Second Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. Second Corinthians 11, verse 3. But I fear. Paul the apostle, what are you fearing? Isn't God sovereign? But I fear, Paul the Apostle, what are you fearing? Is anybody that gets saved, if they are forever saved? Why are you afraid? Because, uh, you know, the false teacher said there's nothing to be afraid of. There's nothing to be afraid of. You're saved, you're forever saved. You're a child, you're forever a child. Look at this, but I fear less by any means. As the serpent beguiled, deceived Eve, through his subtlety, so your mind shall be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. He says, I'm afraid. I bestowed labor upon you. I preached the gospel unto you. And now you've given your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. New life has come. Repentance has come. Sorrow for sin has come. And your life has now changed. But I'm still afraid of you. I'm afraid of you. Lest the devil, the say, that, that serpent, will beguile you. And then he'll corrupt the gospel. How did he beguile Eve? How did he, what was the subtlety? Genesis chapter 3, and we're reading from verse 1. Genesis chapter 3, reading from verse 1. And here is what Paul the Apostle is referring to when he said, through subtlety, through subtlety, they deceive you and they beguile you. It says in chapter 3, verse 1, Genesis, now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, yea, as God said, Look at that, innocent, as God said, look at that subtle, as God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. That started the conversation. And eventually, he took of that uh, forbidden fruit. The eyes got opened, saw her nakedness, and saw her shame, and the glory of God departed from her. She gave to the husband, and did she also ate. And look at the final result here in verse uh, 23 verse 23 of Genesis chapter 3. It tells us in verse 23, therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. He lost, he, he, he missed that. He lost that. Because now he couldn't remain in that garden of 
pleasure and get that garden of peace anymore. He was driven out. But you see how the devil was subtle. The same thing, you know. Uh, let's come to uh, let's come to Matthew chapter twenty-six. Matthew chapter twenty-six is through subtlety. Matthew chapter twenty-six. I'm reading from verses three and four. Matthew chapter twenty-six, verses three and four. Then uh, assembled together the chief priests and the scribes and uh, the elders of the people unto the palace of the chief priest who was called Caiaphas. Listen to this verse four and consulted that they might take Jesus. Tell me. Tell me out loud. By subtlety, secretly. Falsehood is subtle. They will not do it openly because they are told the people, he has a devil. And the people said, this, one does, this person does not look like somebody who has a devil. And they said, yes, he is not of God. Can somebody who is not of God open the eyes of the blind? Do our leaders know really that this is the Christ? And so they saw that if they came directly, they will not, they will not win. And so they have to be subtle about that. The same thing when they come to you and they want to deceive you, that's the caution the Lord is giving us that devil, the devil is subtle and Judas has carried himself became subtle and all the people who have read about they came in and eventually they were lost they were, they were deceived by subtlety. I pray that the craftiness of the devil, the subtlety of the devil and of the messengers of Satan will not catch you I will not make you to perish in Jesus' name. Ephesians chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 4, I'm reading here from verse 12. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 12, it says, The ministry, the ministers are for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, and for the defining of the body of Christ. So we all come in the unity of the faith, and of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, and unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ verse 14 look at this that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine but the sledge of men and what follows there cunning craftiness that's subtlety cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive they will not deceive you they will not catch you you are going to stand on the word of God in Jesus' name. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, we're reading from verse 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 1, I the, uh, therefore see uh, we have this ministry. Well, as we receive, as we have received mercy, we faint not. Any fainting person there? tired person there you know the battle is too long you know emphasizing the truth all the time and not everybody understands you know it's too much and then we'll come back the following week again and we still have to stand on this truth of the word of god and people are saying when are you going to change when are you going to move on to another thing we're, we're looking for healing we're looking for material things we're looking for blessing we're looking for fruit of the womb and you're talking about this about this all the time and i want you to get tired but look at your faces i don't see tired faces there are there tired faces there you keep on standing on the word of god in jesus name of course of course when it's time to preach healing you preach healing when it's time for deliverance you preach deliverance and when it's time to have miracles you have miracle but when it's time to emphasize holiness without which no man shall say the lord you'll not back out you'll not be tired you'll not be weak because this is that that will take them to heaven. Healing is good here, but it will not take people to heaven in isolation. Deliverance is good here. Prosperity is good here. Having money is good here. Having miracle children good here. But will not take anybody to heaven in isolation. If there's anything that will take anybody to heaven, follow peace. Help me complete it. Amen. And tell me the rest. Without which no man shall see the Lord. That's why, as you have received this kind of ministry, you will not be tired. Amen. I said you will not be tired. 
but were renounced in verse 2 the hidden things of dishonesty not walking in craftiness nor handling the word of God deceitfully but by manifestation of the truth commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the fear of God we'll continue in the word of God and we we'll keep on emphasizing this because this is the ministry the Lord has given unto us. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Did you hear that before? I said, did you hear that before? Okay, read it out and let me see whether you've heard it before. Whether you're familiar with this one, two, three, go. Tonight you are renewed in Jesus' name. Re-energized in Jesus' name. Refreshed in Jesus' name. With new strength you are going out. With new power you are going out. This work that God has committed into our hands, we will do it until the finishing line in Jesus' name. If you are the only person in your community, if you are the only person in your local government, the only person in your area that knows this Bible, swallows this Bible, believes this Bible, obeys this Bible, and will take the whole Bible to the whole community, if you are the only one, you will stand. Even if you have all the opposition of demons and people against you and the front watch you, you are going to stand in Jesus' name. See how many people Paul the Apostle took to heaven. How many people are you going to take to heaven? One, ten, a hundred, a thousand. Are you going to stay at a limited number? What's your vision? And what are you looking at? All the other people, they say they're preaching, they're preaching. But what are they preaching? But God is raising you up. He's calling you. He's commissioning you. And he's saying, I don't want all these people to be lost. And you are the person that will reach out to them the keys in your hand. You'll open the door of the kingdom for them. And through you, many will be saved in Jesus' name. All the weakness of the past If your knees are weak tonight They are strengthened And if your backbone is weak tonight They are strengthened If your voice is getting weak tonight They are strengthened If your conviction is getting weak tonight They are strengthened And you are saying Oh Lord help me I forget the past Now I am going to move on He has not given us the spirit of fear Of timidity But of love And of a power And of a sound mind Am I talking to somebody there today And are you ready for this God is going to empower you as a special ambassador for the Lord why don't you rise up and tell the Lord oh Lord I am ready oh Lord I'm ready oh Lord I'm ready it's going to use you it's going to use you it's going to do so something through you and all the fears of the past all the timidity of the past and everything that appears and you know I've been giving you setback I say maybe I cannot maybe I cannot now you can now you can now you can and there's no fear in your heart anymore let your bones be strengthened let your knees be strengthened let your backbone be strengthened let your heart be strengthened and let your life come alive come again at the very altar and say lord i surrender myself once again i'm going to do this work with the real strength